Coming up on One Detroit, water quality along the Rouge River, how it's changed. Plus, Nolan and Stevens sound off on the Democratic debates coming to Detroit this month. The music of Detroit, the music that people in Detroit like is really raw and honest, but it's a, about as soulful as any music you're going to hear. And the concert of colors this weekend in the city. I'm Christy McDonald. Join me at the Detroit Historical Museum. One Detroit is coming up. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV the Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget, cut long-term debt, fix our roads, improve all levels of education, further economic growth, plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi there and welcome to One Detroit. I'm Christy McDonald. Hope you're having a great week. There's a lot going on in the city and beyond. We're here at the Detroit Historical Museum. This is actually where our One Detroit home base is. We have offices upstairs. It's our home away from home. And while you may have seen a lot of the great exhibits here, there's a new one marking the 100th anniversary of the Detroit Stars and Detroit's black baseball history. We'll have a lot more on that coming up on the show. Plus, we're really focusing on our water quality in Michigan, whether it's what comes out of our taps or what we fish in or boat on. See how a recent cleanup of the Rouge River is changing how people see this waterway that stretches throughout southeast Michigan. Plus, I'll catch up with Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. They'll debate whether the upcoming Democratic presidential debates in Detroit this month will hold a lot of weight with voters. Also coming up, we'll spend some time with bass player and renowned musician Don Was as he celebrates 60 years of Motown Records this weekend. He's the headliner at the Concert of Colors in Detroit. It is all coming up for you on the show. But we're starting off with a closer look at a cleanup along the Rouge. If you're from here, you know that back in the 70s and 80s, the Rouge River was known as dirty and polluted. The entire river system stretches 126 miles. It was named a national area of concern back in 85. But in the last 20 years, the cleanup of the Rouge has made a big difference in water quality and recreation. Will Glover has our Great Lakes Now report. Dearborn under a Southfield Freeway overpass. She's, a, she's an antique. A very short portage for this Rouge Rescue 2019 cleanup crew. They're near the 12th hole of a golf course down by the river. Hasn't tipped yet. Okay, yeah. Come on, baby, get in. The city has applied for some dollars to install some uh, kayak launch here where we're at at Dearborn Hills Golf Course and at Ford Field. So we got a couple log jams we're gonna take on uh, downstream from here. David Norwood and these Friends of the Rouge are loaded with ropes and saws to remove obstacles on the waterway. The Friends of the Rouge have been running river cleanups for 33 years. This year, volunteers worked 28 sites in 18 communities in Metro Detroit. According to these Friends, a few decades ago, this river was regarded as the dirtiest in the nation. The Rouge was even pronounced dead. 1969 was kind of a watershed event. The Rouge River caught fire, and that was a result of all the industrial waste and different uh, dumping that was going on in the river, so you had some hydrocarbons that uh, caught fire. You know, just 20... 1969, the same year the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland caught fire. That fire got more attention. Back then, rivers were more like open industrial sewers. But attitudes changed and cleanup efforts have helped make it safe to actually step in the water again. 
well, not suggest you submerge yourself, but we can have contact and I, I kayak and paddle it all the time. Anything that's water related, river related, is really uh, my priority. Jeff Ballander studied freshwater biology in college, but spent his career in the construction business. Now retired, he's on a mission to improve the Rouge. About 15 years ago, uh, I was paddling on the Huron River and my brain just went, this river is too pretty, it doesn't need my help. And the Rouge River captured my attention and I decided that I was gonna help the Rouge River. The Friends of the Rouge have organized paddling trips on the Rouge since 2003 to help change perceptions of the river and make it a recreational attraction. And if you can uh, daycation, spend a day, you're not necessarily going to go up to the Osabo River. You can actually do wilderness paddling right here in Dearborn. Ballander has been working to extend paddling opportunities on the Lower Rouge hoping for a 27-mile water trail from Canton Township all the way to the Detroit River. Funding is in the works to build access sites, signage, and a lot more to help clear out the log jams like this one. So all the investment by the different communities upstream and downstream from here, you're seeing the river getting much cleaner. And we're seeing fish now that uh, we haven't seen in 20 years that are, are migrating up the river and actually inhabiting the river, whether it's bass, perch, northern pike, salmon, trout. They're in here. For more coverage of water issues and all things Great Lakes, just head to greatlakesnow.org. All right, turning now to some politics, it was quite a 4th of July weekend with some fireworks within the Michigan congressional delegation. Republican Justin Amash, at odds with President Trump, declared himself an independent. It's too soon to see what ripple effect it will have nationally, but the Democratic candidates for president will be sure to seize upon that defection when they come here to Detroit later this month for the next round of debates. We caught up with one Detroit contributors, Nolan Finley of the Detroit News and Stephen Henderson of WDET Radio, for what to expect of the Fox Theater from this field of candidates. Well, Steve, July 31st, yes. coming up quickly. We will have the whole Democratic Party. Yes, here in, in Detroit. Detroit. Yes, all, all two dozen, who knows, <laughs> uh, or more. Maybe three dozen by then. Presidential candidates, and all with a shot of getting on that stage at yeah. the Fox Theater. Yeah, uh, you know, so can you think of the last time we didn't get something like this during a primary in Michigan? No, I mean, it's it, an important thing. It, it's state. something that it seems to happen each time, and it's because they recognize that. Uh, in both primaries, in fact, uh, when there are competitive primaries, you gotta you gotta win Michigan, and yeah. uh, uh, you start by that summer before now, you know, 18 months before the election, uh, on stage, uh, debating everybody else. It's the importance of being a purple state. Nobody can be certain if this state's going to go to one party or the other party. Well, we lost certainty election. for a long time. Yeah, but but <laughs> there's always a possibility yeah, that you can get right. Michigan, and that and, and we saw Hillary Clinton's. Uh, neglect of Michigan last time out cost her, may have cost her the election, and so everybody's coming here now. But when you look at this debate, I, it seems unworkable for me. The threshold for getting on the stage is 65,000 individual in donations. Yeah. Uh, these candidates all down the list are getting there. You got two days worth of debates, as many as 12 on the stage each night. Yeah. I don't know how useful that's going to be for a voter sorting out their choice. So I think if you are someone who doesn't know very much about any of the candidates, you're somebody who's looking for someone to support, this is actually in a bad format. I mean, you'll get mm. to see everybody uh, in, in some form or another. And for the candidates, uh, those candidates who are, um, you know, not as well financed, not as well known, yeah. This is the only chance to make sure. their case to the voters uh, on a national stage. You do get to see everybody, but the reality is most of those people don't have a shot. They uh, don't. And so this lends itself to a soundbite debate where everybody's trying to go in there and say something so provocative that they make a headline and all of a sudden their numbers shoot up. You don't get to through the substance. We saw that in the, the Republican debates last, last time. time out when you had 16, 17 folks up on that stage and everybody just clamoring yeah. to to get their soundbite out. But, but speaking of, you know, who has a chance and who doesn't, uh, four years ago, we would have said, well, Donald Trump, 
He says he's going to run, and he says he's going to do this. Yeah, but he once he got in the win. race, it was all about Trump. And I think the similarity this time is going to be Joe Biden against the hordes here, and everybody is going to be trying to take shots at Joe Biden, Maybe. try to uh, take him down, and I think that hurts the party for the general election. There's five Democrats now that poll 5% or more, or more in the polls. Those should be the people on the stage in Detroit. I mean, I, I, I would support the idea of doing something like that in addition to this, right? Uh, let's, let's have an open debate with everybody getting a chance, and then let's have a different debate, maybe at a different time, with the people who are in the front row. <laughs> so you can have, like, right? semifinals, yeah, right. then pick five finalists <laughs> That's to debate. Right. That's right. I don't know. But it's I so think early. it's going to be unworkable uh, to have that many people on the stage over two nights. You don't get the sort of matchups and, and back and forth. What you get is a whole lot of people trying to grab trying to a few get minutes moment, of spotlight. Yeah. And it, it's going to be all about Joe Biden. So why not pit Joe Biden against the three or four people who might ha actually have a shot yeah, at beating him for the nomination? Uh, yeah, I would hate to see people cut off at this point. It's so early. There's still a lot of opportunity. If you can get on that stage and say something that connects with voters who have never seen yeah. you before, now you're in the race. And I don't think you want to eliminate that quite yet. If it were December, January, all right, now we gotta be a little more serious about it. One way or the other, it's gonna be a big week in Detroit. It's a big one uh, for us. Everybody will be here, the eyes of the world will be here because it's one of the first debates and it'll be what, really the start of the political season. So we're looking forward yeah, to it. It's too early still, I say, but uh, can't do anything about that. But it's here. Yeah. And we'll be talking about it on One Detroit. Yes, we will. All right, thanks, guys. You know, summertime means baseball to a lot of people, especially here in Detroit, where we have a rich heritage and a very passionate fan base. Well, here at the Detroit Historical Museum, there is a special exhibit to highlight the Negro Leagues. And this summer marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Detroit Stars. The exhibit showcases the saga of Detroit's black baseball history in an era of segregation. It's a poignant opportunity to look and learn from our past. Stephen Henderson explored the emotions around the exhibit on American Black Journal. It started when um, Gary Gillette, who was invited to a meeting of the uh, Black Historic Sites Committee, uh, and he said, well, there is this historic Hamtramck Stadium uh, that where one of the few stadiums still left in the country where the Negro Leagues were allowed to play. Mm -hmm. And so from that, we got involved because it was a centennial anniversary, 1919. And with the exhibit, we get to tell that story of the legendary teams, the players. The exhibit is up through September. So that's kind of how it started. And it really is a chance for the public to be educated about America's pastime. Yeah. It's a chapter of history that really this hasn't mm -hmm. been told. Yeah. Gary, you you have been involved with this issue for a long time, I know. About uh, 10 years. Yeah. 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 Uh, talk about who the Detroit Stars were uh, and why it's sort of significant to try to preserve that history. Well, the Detroit Stars were founded in 1919. They were the first major Negro League team in Detroit. There would have been black teams coming through town to play white teams mostly because uh, it was better payday to play white teams because then white fans would show up, right? <laughs> right. And um, in 1920, they were a charter member of the first major Negro League, the Negro National League. So next year we have the centennial of the founding of the Negro National League, which will be a national celebration. The Stars played in Detroit until 31 when they were a victim of the Great Depression along with the league. There was a new Detroit Stars team in 33, lasted a year, a new team in 37, lasted a year. Um, it was really hard during the Depression. Major League teams struggled, mm -hmm. and several Major League teams uh, almost went bust as well. So it's not peculiar to the Negro Leagues. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell the history of the African American community in Detroit without talking about the most popular sport, except for boxing, Joe Lewis, who was, of course, a hero in Detroit and then an international hero. Baseball, the Negro Leagues were the big deal. Yeah. Uh, and uh, your father, Turkey Stearns, is somebody uh, who's closely associated with the Stars. It is one of my favorite uh, historical baseball players, uh, black, white, or whatever. Uh, talk about what you remember about uh, your father and uh, him playing in these leagues. Well, I, my dad was a great person. Unfortunately, my sister and I were born after he had stopped he playing. Done, yeah. So, you know, I get to hear the stories from other people. And he's had all of his inductions have been posthumous. 
Um, so he died in 1979, and he was inducted into the Afro-American Sports Hall of Fame in 1987, um, 2000, the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, 2007, Michigan Sports Hall of Fame, 2010, Tennessee Sports Hall of Fame, and we visited Kauffman Stadium, um, where the Kansas City Royals play. They have their own Hall of Fame, and he's inducted in the Cooperstown section. Huh. And also, the Tigers put a permanent plaque yeah. in 2007. Yeah. So yeah. phenomenal athlete. Yeah, yeah. And, and great father. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alana, welcome to uh, American Black. This is the Thank first time you. we're having it you is, here yes. as the new uh, director over there. Uh, talk about the importance of these kinds of exhibits uh, yeah. at the museum. Well, as you know, Stephen, the, our mission at the Detroit Historical Society is to tell Detroit stories and why they matter. Mm -hmm. And to have an opportunity like this to tell a story that really matters that so many people don't know about, yeah. you know, is really remarkable. <laughs> um, and it's very popular. As Karen said, it's open till the end. September. We're free all summer, so we really hope everyone comes down to Midtown to, to visit the museum. But this has been a great opportunity for really a remarkable partnership. Um, the Historical Society and the Black Historic Sites Committee um, have been partners. Uh, we we celebrate. Uh, we both celebrate our. We celebrate our centennial in uh, 2021, mm -hmm. and the Black Historic Sites Committee celebrates their 50th. Um, the same year. So this has been a long time partnership, but this is the first time that we're doing an exhibition together. And to partner as well with Gary and his group at the historic Hamtramck Stadium has been, uh, you know, really a, a great experience for us in pulling together different organizations um, to tell a story that needs to be told. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember your dad talking about not being able to play in the major leagues and, and what that meant to him? Yeah, he didn't dwell on that, but he talked about the uh, segregation, the fact that they weren't allowed to play, and he felt that they were as good or better mm -hmm. than the players that played in the, he the major league. Was, well, right. Certainly was, and they, I know they barnstormed the Detroit Tigers uh, all-star team barn, barnstormed the Detroit Tigers, I think, 13 times and beat them 11 out of 13. Right? <laughs> My dad was not bitter. Um, I think he was disappointed. Yeah. that he missed out on that opportunity because there was no compensation, you know, the monetary compensation that they deserved, they didn't get. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what do you think he would make of uh, all of the hullabaloo about him now? I mean, he's, he's much more celebrated <laughs> now than he was then, right? I, you know, I've told people before, I think my dad would be in awe because he was a very conservative, um, low-key, reserved person. So he'd, he'd be kind of shocked because when we went to the Negro League's reunion in um, 1979 and July 4th weekend, he got to see all the guys that were still alive. There were like ten of them. Uh -huh. And my dad had a hearing loss and so when they were talking to him, um, he was excited to see them and then they, when they realized it was him, Turkey, like they were like, oh wow. And I got to sit there and watch them talk about how wonderful he was and it was almost like they kind of like worshiped him almost, you know. <laughs> but my dad, it, he didn't care about that. Yeah. So I think he'd be happy. Um, he could celebrate all these inductions, sure. and the recognition, but he didn't need that. Yeah. And finally, this week kicks off the 27th annual Concert of Colors in Detroit. It's a free multi-day festival showcasing Detroit's musical and ethnic diversity. And one of the headliners this year is bassist and musician Don Was. He's taking part in celebrating 60 years of Motown records in this year's Detroit All-Star Review. Well, we got a chance to catch up with Don as he was rehearsing for the event this weekend, as well as Concert of Colors founder Ishmael Ahmed. So we have some behind the scenes rehearsal footage for you, plus more on the impact Motown had on Don's music and why the Concert of Colors brings in so many different artists. It's just meant to be fun. It's kind of a Detroit celebration. I think it's just more of a communal event where a group of 2,000 like-minded people <laughs> get together for a night and, and hear songs that they love and songs that uh, have their roots in our town. Yes. This year, our, our theme is a celebration of the 60th anniversary of, of the birth of Motown Records. It's a lot of fun to play those songs <laughs> more than anything else, but we got Martha and the Vandellas, and we have the Velvelettes, and uh, Mitch Ryder's going to be there, and then a, a, a lot of other local performers. And we're just going to uh, do our versions of, uh, of some Motown classics. Well, let me just tell you how we met. I used to like his band in the 90s or 80s. Was not was, I was a fan of the band, but didn't think a lot about it. And then one day, an Algerian band 
came to play the concert of colors. And guess who the bass player in that band was? Don was. So after it was done, I invited the band out to dinner in Dearborn, and we just sat there talking about Detroit. I mean, we bonded over Detroit. We had some common background. We both used to go see the MC5 at the Grandy Ballroom, yes. and I think that was how the conversation started. Uh, and I, I think we have, a, I don't want to say a political outlook necessarily, but a global view that's, that's similar. We both had ideas that were similar. He came to Detroit, and this will be the 12th year uh, of the review. He once told me, I ask him every year, are you willing to do this again? And he always goes, I'll do it in your living room. Concert of Colors has always been about something, uh, about diversity. In fact, it's called the Concert of Colors Detroit's Diversity Festival. This year, it will be about uh, freedom of expression. But we also are about the music, and we're also about people getting together. So we're a different kind of a concert. The music of Detroit, the music that people in Detroit like is really raw and honest. I'll, I'll go to like John Lee Hooker as an example. That's about the rawest blues you're ever gonna hear. But it's a, about as soulful as any music you're gonna hear in, anywhere in the world. The ability for people to work together is clearer in music and cultures get respected the way they need to be by the presentation of their music and other arts and so it's really important that this be part of the agenda uh, and certainly we're not the only ones doing it but no one is doing it on this scale and in this way <laughs> I think there's something about Detroit that it, it, it instills it in the, the population of the city. I think it's maybe because everybody's kind of in the same boat. Certainly when I was growing up here, that was the case where everyone's, uh, everyone's income, everyone's well-being depended on the welfare of the automobile business. There was really no point in putting on any airs. I, I never saw limousine until I got to California. They just didn't have them around here. I never saw Rolls Royce or a Bentley. There was no point in leasing a, a big expensive car to impress your friends because no one was impressed because everyone knows that we're all in the, in the same right. stuff together. Well, that's a really nice thing about Detroit. and It, it creates uh, an environment where I, I think people are really honest with each other. It's a, it's a very real city. The music that comes out of here is very real. And if, if you're not putting on it, any airs, you sort of look after each other a little bit. And I, I sense that, you know, I, I'm, I'm in, in my job at Blue Note Records, I'm moving around the world the whole, all the time. And it, it just feels like people are nicer to each other here. I don't know how to put it any other way. Not that it's important, but an Arab and a Jew who really are, you know, so close to each other about things that they believe in and so forth. And that's just an icon of what, you know, is what is possible out of Concert of Colors and this world. Uh, there's, there is so much that we all have in common. Don't underestimate the power of music and culture to change the world, because it does. Life is tough, man. You know, like, we don't know why we're here. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know if we're gonna drop dead in the next 10 seconds. We don't know if we're gonna get fired. We don't know if we're gonna get divorced. It's tough to deal with. It's a lot for people to carry around. And anything that helps you forget about your burdens and dance for an hour and a half, you should make a point to participate in that. <laughs>
The Concert of Colors continues from this Thursday through July 18th. And Don Was will be performing July 13th at the DIA. For the entire week of events, just head to our website, DetroitPBS.org, and we'll have it there for you. Thanks so much for joining me. Make sure you check back with us next Thursday for another new One Detroit. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you then. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV the Detroit Journalism Engagement Fund, and by Business Leaders for Michigan has five priorities to make Michigan a top 10 state. Achieve a balanced budget, cut long-term debt, fix our roads, improve all levels of education, further economic growth, plan for a stronger Michigan. How does diversity bring energy to us all? At DTE Energy, we believe that it's the contributions of all that build great communities. As a company, we grow stronger by welcoming the unique perspectives of everyone. As community members, we support our state's broad culture and heritage. From working closely with women and minority-owned suppliers to embracing our local cultures, DTE Energy is powering diversity. The DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public Television. Also brought to you by Ally and viewers like you. Thank you.